Welcome everyone to this fourth session now already since the morning. The session on AMR and preventing the next pandemics and the AMR Action Fund. Since this morning, we had a chance to hear about the political commitment that is vouched to us for the patient safety uh, from uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Jeremy Hunt and then from Dr. Abdulayla al Hafsavi, who have both been very instrumental in instituting the uh, World Patient Safety Day for us, but also in gathering the political momentum. But um, I think you would agree that uh, a political commitment is hugely import important, but it's not the only thing that we need. What we need beyond the political commitment is to really have an innovative thinkers and people who would take um, things to a next level, who would cause change, who will bring new ways to life and to things. And as Einstein once said, uh, you cannot expect different results if you do the things the same way. So in that respect, I have the very big pleasure and an honor to invite the two speakers at today's um, a session. That is a very interesting session. And for me, it is, um, as I said, even to them, it is a um, um, pity that it cannot be much longer. I hope we will have another chance to have a longer session to discuss more. So these two uh, speakers I introduce one by one. Um, so to give the honor um, as needed. Um, First speaker is Dame Sally Davis. Um, she's, uh, since last year, she is the UK government special envoy on AMR. But since many, many years, she has been a true supporter of the fight in the AMR. And through her, um, not only experience and extensive desire and passion to help the AMR, but also with the critical thinking, any innovative mind has brought change. The one that Einstein was saying, so um, before giving you the floor, I would like to also congratulate you on the innovative Trinity Challenge to protect the future generations from pandemics that has just been um, launched a couple of days ago. And uh, we would like to hear more from you on what are your visions and how you think we cannot overcome the pandemic, the current pandemic, but also the other one lurking, which is the AMR. The floor is yours. Thank you, Neva. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and today, as you know, World Patient Safety Day, and I'm glad that my former boss, who was the Minister for Health, Jeremy Hunt, um, introduced that. He's done a terrific amount personally to raise the awareness about patient safety. And um, we're talking about innovation. Hey! A year ago, I never thought I would crack a platform like this and be doing talks by Zoom and everything. So congratulations, International Alliance of Patient Organizations. It's an inspiring conference and you're looking forward with optimism. And hey, we've got to do that with, with reality as you're doing. But what you bring to the fore is the point that collaboration is vital for all our health security. And I want to wish you the international I knocked something, sorry. I've moved it so I can't knock it. I want to wish you a very happy 21st birthday. So look what you've done in the last 20 years. What can you do going forwards? And we're at a crucial point. We're witnessing one pandemic at the moment. And what I want to talk about is antimicrobial resistance, AMR, the other pandemic. And I've, since the beginning of COVID, I've been talking about the lobster. The lobster was dropped into boiling water with COVID and it's screaming and everyone's looking at it, wondering what to do, how to eat it best. But AMR is the lobster dropped into cold water, slowly heating up and we will die. It's already costing us a lot in patient suffering. Over 60,000 newborn babies in India dying of untreated, untreatable sepsis, um, 25,000 or more each year in the European Union dying of antimicrobial resistance. So it costs us in lives and suffering. It costs our health systems. I always frame it that if you've got a patient with antimicrobial resistance, it usually 
doubles the mortality, doubles the time in hospital, and doubles the cost. This is just not sensible. And it's impacting on our GDP. A Canadian study showed that they're already losing the equivalent of their motor industry to their GDP. So you'd think that everyone would want to sort it out. Because if it's that bad and costing that much, it might be cheaper to sort it than to put up with it. So why haven't we? It's because it's hidden. And because antibiotics are sold so cheaply that actually they're not valued by the patients, the doctors, the system enough. And because they're so cheap, what happens is the pharma companies say, hey, there's no profit, so why should we invest? And after me, we'll hear about the new efforts of pharma, for which I do congratulate them. We in Britain have another approach. We've been, along with many people, putting money into more research, but we'll only get new antibiotics if we pay for their true value, which isn't by standard health technology assessments. The true value has to be calculated to our health system and ideally later on into society as a whole. And we have a new uh, project, it's a pilot trying two new um, drugs and I congratulate Shionogi for bringing their new drug into Britain um, now. But it is about trying them out using evaluation that isn't per pill, it's about the value to the NHS so that the doctors and nurses are encouraged to steward and look after it, but the patients can have the drugs they need. So we're really excited about that project. It's part of our 20 year vision, our five year plan, what to do. So why do I care about this? I care about it because without antibiotics, people die and we lose modern medicine. To be open, Let's recognize that at the moment, more people die across the world of untreated infections than of AMR, but that is going to change. COVID is potentially making it worse because we know that the driver of resistance, which is after all um, survival of the fittest, it's Darwinism, is more use. And most people who end up on ventilators are being given antibiotics, either to prevent ventilator-related inf infections or because they've got them. So there is likely, um, and we've got increasing evidence, overuse. So why have we not managed to get this lobster out of the water before it's dead? I would argue that it's because we don't have a proper patient face. How many people on this Zoom knew when their relatives had infections and the doctor said, oh, we're just changing the antibiotic. This one might work better, that actually there was resistance. How many were told to their faces or on death certificates that there was a resistant organism that was not responding, that played a significant, if not the final role in that death? We are not talking about it with the patients. It's a conspiracy of silence, unintentional, but we need a patient face. And if you've got cancer, you already are likely to be more prone to infections. Most of the modern therapies, which are wonderful and save lives, actually make you more prone to infection for a period of time. You should be the face of demanding more and better antibiotics. But if you have had a transplant, if you've got diabetes, renal failure, so many conditions, you need antibiotics. Why are you not clamoring and asking for this? Because together we can do things. It's not the only way you can do it. You need to be making a patient call and a patient voice through the health systems, but more publicly, We've just launched in January of this year, the Investor Year of Action. And what are we doing there? We're calling on everyone, including patients, their families and public to put pressure on investors so that they invest in companies that 
do ethics, societal and govern societal good and governance. This is what's been used in climate change to get people to change how they behave. It's working. McDonald's are now saying that they will use meat that has come from places where they don't use antibiotics for growth promotion by the end of the year. But we need to use this investor and public power in the uh, investor year of action. We need to use it with pharma companies and everyone. So I do think we can do things together and we can make a difference. And I know Thomas is going to talk to that. We can find new antibiotics, they're coming out. We can bring them through, but we need the patient and public demand for the money to be spent on it. And hey, look at what's being spent on COVID. Aren't we nuts as a society not to spend the small amount that would make the difference? Jim O'Neill's report in 2016 said if we go on as we are, by 2050, there would be more people dying, 10 million a year, of AMR than of cancer. This should not be acceptable. So we've got to work together. I've been working with Thomas. I've been working with all sorts of people. We have to work together. I call you to arms. Save the lobster, save modern medicine, save yours and our lives. If we don't do this, I won't be able to look my children and grandchildren in the eye because this is steadily getting worse. We will have to mobilize and do things differently. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Sally Davis. This was so inspiring and so eye-opening, honestly. And um, one, of our, uh, one of my professors at the university used to say, and I'm uh, from a pharmaceutical background, he used to say, you know, we need to really um, consider antibiotics as borrowed from the future generations and not as an inheritance from the past. So I think we should behave towards them like that. And with this being said and coming to the antibiotics, it is very easy for all of us as a health providers or even as patients to pull out our hand and get the box. But then there is a huge process behind it to develop them to be safe, affordable, efficacious. And um, I would like to now invite our second speaker, who is another brilliant mind, I have to say, exceptional supporter to the patients, our continuous partner, because the industry is really um, working towards the most and the best for the patients. And Dr. Thomas Queni is really the face, if I can say, of all the innovative efforts that are looking into the human dimension of the patients. So it is very challenging to say all of the things I want to say to introduce you. I will just say that um, from OECD uh, Business uh, Health Committee uh, to the chair of the AMR Alliance, um, um, to diverse, diverse positions, you really amalgamate all the efforts throughout the vision that we all have for the better care and for having the new antibiotics that we will put the real price tag as Dr. Dame, um, Sally Davis said. So I would like to invite you now to please share with us what were the reasons behind the industry? What was the rationale for the industry to establish the new AMR Action Fund when the industry is calling for market reform for sustainable AMR R&D? Thank you work. very much, Neda, and thanks a lot to Ayapo uh, for inviting me actually second time at this conference because I talked about COVID-19 vaccine research yesterday, and not a daunting challenge, but uh, you know, it's a tough act to follow Dame Sally, as I knew, having listened to her again, oh my God, I'm a bit intimidated now, you made me blush, and I'm tempted to zoom out so that you see me more from the distance. But I'm really happy to share with you a bit of the background and history which drove me uh, to really trigger, and I think it's fair to say trigger this AMR Action Fund, which didn't come out, you know, of nothing. Uh, I was in 2017, I moved to Geneva to take over the reins at the IFPMA, 
And within four months, uh, I was asked to chair the AMR Industry Alliance. And I think one important element in the context of AMR, we have in there not just big pharma, we have biotech companies, we have generic companies, and we have also diagnostic companies. And one of the struggles they Sally mentioned it, is the proper value of antibiotics. The pr problem is that often diagnostics, which would be necessary to make sure that gen uh, antibiotics are used appropriately, are more expensive than cheap genetics. And uh, the BBC, I think a couple of years ago, ran a documentary which basically said antibiotics are cheap, uh, vets are expensive. That's why in many countries in the world you can go and buy your antibiotics without even a prescription. Therefore, I want to start with that because we will only be able to tackle AMR, this silent killer, and this next already now looming global pandemic, if we start to use antibiotic, antibiotics with caution and appropriately, not just for human use, but also for animal use. Actually, for plant use, I learned from Dame Sally that in some parts of the world, you use antibiotic injections for growth stimulation of citrus plantations. I couldn't believe it. I made a bit of a stir at the Global NCD conference in Montevideo a couple of years ago when an industry lobbyist stood up and said, I stopped eating chicken years ago because I don't trust, trust the chicken farmers. And I recalled that when I was at the airport security, a lady from WHO came up to me and said, but not in Switzerland. You know, I'm Swiss, she was American. I said, I wouldn't eat them in Switzerland either. Maybe Boulard de Bresse might be different <laughs> since both Sally and I have a love for France. But, you know, the serious story is we need to be careful about how we use antibiotics. We need to look into access to antibiotics. There are more people dying from lack of access to antibiotics, as Sally said, than dying from resistance. We need to care for the environment, and the AMI Industry Alliance has been uh, pioneering manufacturing discharge targets. The way we treat the environment is a big issue, but we also need new antibiotics, because even with the best of efforts in terms of One Health, appropriate use, we will need new antibiotics because bacteria are so adaptable. And the problem is that in 2014, Jim O'Neill came out with his report for David Cameron and, you know, stirred the pot and said, we really need to do something. And AMR has been on the agenda of ONGA, of uh, G7, G20. Dame Sally really has been a tireless champion of the course for AMR, but we were both, I think it was in 2018, at the call to action, which the UK government co-hosted in Berlin. And I was bullied to, I think it's fair to say, by Lord O'Neill, who didn't know me yet at that time. And when he said, you know, for God's sake, industry should stop moaning and invest in research because everybody agrees that we need to give incentives to industry. And my reaction was, I beg your pardon, Lord O'Neill, signing a G7 press release is not the same as signing a, a billion dollar check. And that was the problem. And I had the pleasure, and I give credit, first to Dame Sally, second to Jim O'Neill for harassing me, but third also to the Welcome Trust, who have done a lot over the last few years to stimulate the debate. But the challenge was industry, and that's where I come in, by and large was blamed for being the culprit. Why does industry, which has so much money, not invest in something which is simply needed? Now, the reason is even you know, profitable companies, they are accountable to their investors, to their shareholders, to their employees to make a living. And it is a tough fact to argue, we need to invest in something where there is no return, where there is no living. Therefore, industry was on the sidelines and said governments should move. Governments basically, you know, they love to talk. Uh, talk is easier than action and also cheaper. And they love to blame us. Therefore, and that's where, you know, these discussions, and I had the privilege of being invited by Dame Sally to a number of meetings like Chatham House, IECG, and others. 
I went back to our companies and said, look, we are not going to see movement unless somebody comes up and steps in first. We have had WHO with the European Investment Bank talking for years about setting up an impact fund. Uh, you've heard this was came in Davos, the ATMI index, the January investment. We haven't seen much action. None of them were able even to raise a triple digit million number. Therefore, we did something which I think is quite unique. I was just on a three day blended finance workshop with Oxford University, Welcome, and the Norwegian Science Trust. And we talked about blended finance. Normally, blended finance is governments injecting money in something to trigger private investment to be a risk. Actually, the AMR Action Fund is a bit the other way around. Within nine months of starting the conversation about it, we were able to raise almost a billion dollars from private companies, 23 pharma companies, most of them never involved in antibiotic research, some of them having quit, a few of them still in, and they really targeted and tasked me to set up something where they do not expect to make money. They have a public health purpose, and I think that's really positive. And Dame Sally said it, and of course she was great. I invited her, with, and she returned my favor <laughs> to it. And she came and gave us a brilliant rallying speech to a CEO roundtable, which triggered the final decision to go ahead. Now, the unique nature of the uh, AMR Action Fund is, although for the time being it's primarily private money, we, from the beginning, involved others. Dame Sally and I sat together September last year in a half-day workshop in, in the margins of Ungar with the world's best experts in AMR, from the Wellcome Trust, to the CEO of Carbex, uh, people involved in the Novo Repair Impact Fund. And what we find out, it's not just about the money. Uh, Sally made a passionate plea, we need the industry, because big pharma, is needed in terms of their know-how how to not waste money on antibiotics which are not worth nurturing, how to do clinical development in a professional way. Startup companies are passionate, are eager, but they're not the most professional engineers. They may be more creative than some of Big Pharma, but you need discipline to bring a product to the market. Big Pharma has, has uh, regulatory skills. Therefore, this combination of drawing on work, which was done by people from the Wellcome Trust, uh, from Lion's Head and the European Investment Bank and WHO, we talked to all of them. And we actually, from the beginning, we involved them in the shaping of the architecture of the fund. So that you, for example, have a clear charter on access. We committed, you know, clearly, triggered also by WHO and others, the novel antibiotics, which hopefully will come out of that, they should be accessible. Now, that needs to go with appropriate stewardship. And, and Dame Sally and I already had a couple of conversations on that. We also want to pursue public health objectives. Therefore, the investment decisions will not be where do we have the high, best chance of return on investment. Actually, if we get if we break even, everybody would be delighted and <laughs> would probably give me a pat on the back. But we want to invest in public health needs, therefore looking at WHO priority list of pathogens and CDC. And finally, we do hope, that's where blended finance come in, that others such as CIB, Wellcome Trust, and hopefully others will join us. But even with a billion dollars, it would be a drop in the ocean if we do not see policy reform. And Dame Sally mentioned the importance of the value. We will drive debates on policy reform. I'm encouraged. Dame Sally gave me the honor to be part of our Berlin virtual launch of the AMR Action Fund. We had three ministers from Germany, France, and Denmark, all delighted at the industry. We had the health commissioner, Kyriakides, from Europe. We had Dr. Tedros. I actually framed his letter where he accepted to come and speak because no IFPMA DG has ever got such a warm letter from the WHO DG. And I must say, 
I'm actually proud of my industry, same as in COVID-19, that it has stepped up. But we need now to call out on governments and we need allies such as you. IAPO can play and patients can play an important role. I look forward to having many more conversations with Dame Sally, because she is as energetic and devil and always a delight to be on the same panel with her. Nida. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you so much. Uh, I think both yesterday and today you were, um, as I said, uh, uh, at the forefront and leading two uh, very innovative initiatives. And uh, as we said, it's a historical moment where even competitors are joining hands to help not only the COVID vaccine development, but here as well with the AMR Action Fund. And I can assure you that you have our commitment as a patient community through IAPO and through other forms that we will join hands with you as well to try to, in a way, first of all, preserve the current antibiotics, but also to um, uh, have a, a, a meaningful stewardship even for the new antibiotics coming on our tables by the tireless work that the industry is putting in to develop them. And I hope we will persuade the government to lend more expertise to us beyond the expertise that they are already uh, giving us through engaging the experts like Sally Davis, like Dame Sally Davis, because she's part of the public university. So in that sense, I think that the government is already participating in a way. <laughs> However, we would like to see them um, be more involved, uh, uh, concurrent with what you are saying. Um, I think we are uh, not having much time. So would you like to take some questions or uh, you will allow me to... Um, take the freedom from Kavaldeep to invite you to uh, the first webinar of our series starting soon after the GPC that we will be having on different aspects uh, just to unfold these bite-sized series that we had throughout the Congress. Would you like to have any uh, final remarks or maybe we just take it to the webinar? Sorry. Uh, uh, thank I'm you very much. happy to uh, just pick up one person on the question and answer asked what the January initiative was and it was um, a launch of the year of the investor for AMR. In fact we're making it much longer than one year because of Covid but it is this um, trying to get people and investors to use ESG to shift how everyone behaves related to antibiotics about investing in the research, investing in making them, investing in stewardship, investing in the food chain so antibiotics are not used where they shouldn't be. So that was the one question I wanted to pick up, but it's been a great pleasure to be here with you and with my friend, Thomas. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this afternoon, we have uh, another session on AMR and sepsis put together. So we really put uh, this issue because it's one of the top issues in the Global Patient Safety Challenge. And thank you very much, uh, Dem Sally. And Thomas, uh, you've been doing such a good job. Uh, it's, you almost have a small halo appearing behind you now. <laughs> such angelic, such humanitarian efforts made by the industry. We really like you and hope we continue <laughs> supporting you. And now I would like to ask the audience uh, to Join us uh, after the mobility break. Do stretch up. Uh, it's World Patient Safety Day. And I always say repetitive strain action and uh, yoga, anything you have to do, please do. And keep uh, hydrating yourself. Those who are having an Indian summer at the moment, uh, uh, keep uh, cool and uh, we'll join you after the mobility break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Neda, you're on mute. Thank you so much. I'm all uh, confused and I really, really picked up so many messages. It's so useful and it's so enlightening. Good. Okay, have a great rest of the conference. And, Thank you um, for extending your time, really. Nice to see you, Thomas. Look after yourself. Bye then. Bye.